Hey you, do you like the Tales from the Crypt series? Do you like spooky things in general? Then check out the Good Evening Kitties podcast. That's Good Evening Kitties podcast. G-O-O-D-E-V-E-N-I-N-G-K-I-D-D-I-E-S podcast. Each week, I'll review a new episode from the TV series, The Tales from the Crypt. Find me on Podbay, Podbean, or iTunes. That's the Good Evening Kitties podcast. Check it out today. I'm going to be lazy. Lean back. I hear you, bro. Embrace the lazy. Yeah, I've been up since 4.30. Not as quite as impressive as you, but... I was like, (laughs) yeah, I wasn't going to say it. (laughs) He was thinking it, but he wasn't going to say it. So, Dan, what'd you get from Taco Bell? Uh, five-layer burrito and a cheesy roll-up. And if you got a five-layer burrito and a cheesy roll-up from Taco Bell, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is Jeff. And that is Melissa. Hi. Oh, hi, Melissa. Hi. Hey, Melissa. What's up? Uh, not too much. I'm uh, here to promote uh, my podcast. That Sweet. you heard at the beginning of the episode. You mean you're not here to talk about Poison the Well? Uh, I'm not sure how much I can contribute, but uh, I'm fun and I'm a musician. I'm a drummer. So. There you go. Well, all right. You're going to have to hang out and uh, just, you know, crack a bunch of jokes with us. I know Jeff is uh, very talented at cracking jokes, especially over Skype. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. He is. That's, that's because Joe can't, like, turn around and... Hit and you. hit me with something. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Now here's the real question: so, so that's, If that's I do censor you Melissa. over Skype, do I have to uh, then make the audio beep sound as though it's coming over Skype as well? Possibly, or you could just like not beat me. That works too. But I want to beat you, Jeff. Beep, like beep, beep, Richie. Oh, I, I, I thought there was beating involved on this one. <laughs> oh no, that's why I'm on Skype, so you can't. Cool. So, so who are we talking about this week, Dan? Poison the well. Poison the well. As in somebody poisoned the water hole. <laughs> Somebody's poisoned the water hole. Yeah, uh, Poison the Well. Um, one of my favorite bands, definitely in my top ten. Really? That high? Yeah, dude. I, I really like Poison the Well. Um, they were formative for me um, as a whatever you want to call, like, screaming singer person um they were uh kind of like a hardcore slash punk kind of yeah yeah like a little bit of that hardcore a little bit of emo type of yeah type of stuff but like not like if you look at when these records released it was kind of done at a time where that like wasn't lame (laughs) yeah they were definitely a product of the year that they were released a lot of the bands in you know 2009 2010 all the way even through 2014, it was still, let's sound like Hope's Fall. Let's sound like He Is Legend. Let's sound like, you know, all those bands. And it just kind of blended together. I definitely got a Hope's Fall vibe off them early, but then, you know, they got a little atmospheric later, which I will definitely be entering Jeffrey's atmosphere when the time is right. Oh, uh, I think I might uh, pull a fast one on you there, because, yeah. Didn't care for the later records, huh? No, I did not. I had a feeling. Um, I'm I'm a little impartial, but we'll uh, we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, tonight, though, I would like to focus on our guest for the time being. Hi. Um, this is <laughs> Melissa. Melissa is a really good friend of ours, and she has a brand new podcast out called Good Evening Kitties Podcast, and that's kitties as in children, not kitties as in <laughs> not, kitty cats. I'm not talking to cats at night. I mean, you do talk to cats at I night. I do. Yeah. I've seen it happen. I, I can cats. vouch. Uh, but no, it's basically uh, something I started. Uh, working on back in June and it's it's I dropped it I think like at the beginning of September but it's basically a review of the Tales from the Crypt series and I take each episode and kind of go through it and kind of chronologically re- review it and have a few audio clips and things like that and I also talk about like the special puns that the Crypt Keeper has and I plan on doing the movies too and maybe even throwing in I've recently bought a portable uh, podcast recorder. Oh, cool. And, uh, I need to get one of those. I'm thinking of doing like uh, scary it. movie reviews, like going to the theater and kind of doing a few okay. different things. That's cool. Oh, on the side, yeah, but, that yeah. sounds like fun. Yeah, definitely uh, check it out. It's uh, I think we're, we're just getting ready to finish season one right now. So next cool. week's episode will... 
I'm actually on it. Uh, Mike did it with me. Okay, awesome. One, so yeah, can't wait to hear that. Yeah. So it, it is definitely the season for some scary movies, and Tales from the Crypt is one of those things that I remember. It wasn't scary, but I felt like it was supposed to be. It and had it took, its moments. It took me years to figure out that this all came from comic books that were kind of, you know, tongue-in-cheek scary. Yeah, from the 50s, the EC comics. Like, it wasn't about the fact that the guy knocked out two people and swapped their heads. It was about, I knocked you out and swapped your heads. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely um, <laughs> like a big wink, I think, to a lot of it. Um, oh yeah, and I yeah. and I love Tales from the Crypt. Uh, actually, the comic series is, was my first uh, introduction to Tales from the Crypt, which is was really cool. Um, watching episodes of the show and them correlating to the yeah. comic because the comic series is extremely old, as far Very as old. I know. Yeah, and, it's a, it was the fifties. Like yeah, 52. so seeing them kind of like more modernized you know modern for when tales of the crypt was out but uh you know i thought it was really cool um i was i thought it was really cool how it was funny but there was some like it was funny in the sense that like everybody says that they have a dark sense of humor but i think like without stuff like tales from the crypt we wouldn't all be that way yeah, and like for me, it was more when I was a kid. I was a little more of a scaredy cat when it came to Halloween and the Crypt Creeper, he, the Crypt Keeper, uh, used <laughs> to freak me out. Just how his puppetry was so cool. Just how they had they have like um, four different remotes just like for his mouth. Mm -hmm. So it's all this different stuff. And so I would be good through the episode, and then I'd be like, Oh my gosh, he's coming! He's coming! And just like I could you know, <laughs> could look at like the beginning or the end. But yeah, so that's why I've seen all the episodes. I love it, and I decided to start the Good Evening Kitties podcast since he's always like, you know, Good Evening Kitties, right? And like yeah. That. So uh, nice. Yeah. So it, it's uh, it's it's pretty fun so far. Do you yeah. remember that like kids relay show that was kind of a rip off of Legends of the Hidden Temple that had the Crypt Keeper in it? I can't remember the name yeah, of it, but it was I like, about, I'm going to be, yeah. you know, in his maze and he's going to crush us. And then this giant wall would move. Yeah, I do talk about that a little in my in the first episode. I kind of do like a brief history on it. But yeah, I ended up spinning off into uh, there were a few like Crypt Keeper cartoons that were a little more. I was going to ask you that about the Crypt Keeper cartoon yeah, series. Yeah. Tales from more, the Crypt Keeper. Yeah. It was actually my favorite. I love that fucking show. And then there was also a Christmas album. Okay. <laughs> oh my God! Really? That, yeah, that they put out. Uh, I think in the '90s, and it had like they would take like um, Christmas songs and change the words up. Okay. Uh, so instead of like deck the halls, I think it was like like deck the halls with with splats of blood or something like that. Like they would change. Wasn't it there? Up. Wasn't there a couple of albums? Based on Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, they had another one too. It was like more of a metal okay. album, I think. There well, were we few. might uh, we might have to have Melissa back for that one. <laughs> yeah. So, what was that. your favorite episode of Tales from the Crypt then, or have you not gotten to? <laughs> yeah, if, well, if it's a big reveal for your podcast, we won't. Oh no, it's fine. It. I only got to the end of the first season, and the first season's only six episodes right now. So, um, the next season is actually eighteen, which I guess is like they finally got the green light to move on. So they're like, we're going to make all these episodes because right. I think there's like ninety six in all. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say, one of my favorites that I'm really excited to get to um, down the road that I'm wanting to maybe have Mike on too, but there was an episode uh, that had Tim Curry in it. Okay. And he plays three different characters. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very grotesque. And he basically plays the parents who are very old and they like to take different uh, salesmen, invite them into their homes and, and kill them if they don't agree to marry their very grotesque, humpback, ugly daughter, also played by Tim Curry. <laughs> and Amazing! It's, it's very yeah. It's it's uh yeah. And Ed Bailey Jr. plays one of the salesmen who's okay. supposed to like fall in love with her. And yeah, so it nice. gets pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I, it's been a while, but I do remember that episode. I loved yeah. Tales from the Crypt. I, I liked anything uh, when I was a teenager, especially that had horror with a with a bit of comedy. You know, so so I, I was a huge like Evil Dead Two and Army of Darkness fan, and then Tales from the Crypt and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I, me and my friends, we used to eat it up, and we would just have like marathons because uh, we had two of our buddies that had HBO, <laughs> and and uh, one of them had this had the massive C band uh, satellites, the ones that are like sixteen feet in diameter, that you actually like rotate. Uh, I don't. I don't. Know if you guys are, yeah, I think old, 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 old school to, yeah. satellite C band, the giant yeah. dish in the front yard that went 
I remember working for DirecTV yes. and pulling up to somebody's house to do a new install <laughs> and then be like, no, I already got a dish. And they'll walk me back and like, like there's like it was vines and shit growing all Can over it. Can you use yeah. this disc or yeah. dish? It should be good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure, you know buddy. Just go sit in your go sit on your couch and wait for the TV to come on. Well, you know what's funny is that uh, you can still get C band in KA and KU yeah. band stuff, so you can get it direct from the feed uh, yep. still, which is actually uh, outside of the like if you go into like Central America, that's kind of a big thing because they're able to get U.S. stations down there uh, with the what the only difference is now I think it's like a twenty two inch dish that's required you don't need that massive eyesore right this has been the introduction to jeff's course on c-band dish <laughs> uh you can find all entries in this at discussmetal.com along with his 7.1 audio courses yeah say so make sure to make sure gosh. email jeff at discuss metal to get that shit yeah and the other fun thing about the show too especially when you're a youth uh you know in middle school or so it was on hbo so it was a little more risque they were able to you know, one of the first episodes I did was in like a strip club. And so, I mean, it, they were able to put a lot more into the show without restrictions. Yeah, I remember that. And I I remember uh, if I could stay up a little bit later and my parents were asleep, I could go <laughs> straight from Tales of the Crypt to Dream On. And that, <laughs> nice. And that was a, that was a big deal because that was like, I mean, as a you know, adolescent to, you know, preteen to teenager you, and you get to see boobs on screen it's you know yeah. especially before the internet was you know you know ruined it for this generation that was a big deal you're like oh my god you didn't know what to think but yeah tales from the crypt is uh, is is classic i love uh listening to john every time that he he laughs it's just like the best thing ever yeah yeah it's one of the great uh sound bites of all generations you just have to no go kidding. back and it's like yeah that 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 sound the crypt keeper just letting loose can you throw that in joe oh that'd be fantastic i guess that towel was a little too hot still i think it's a good look for you once it's grown out i'm sure you'll love it <laughs> You mean like that? Oh, yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome, dude. I'll tell you what, though. You have inspired me. I'm going to go, uh, after we record this episode, I'm going to go watch my favorite episode, which is What's Cooking, which has meatloaf in it. Oh, yeah. I remember oh, that one. Yeah. 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 And I, I actually saw Tales from the Crypt. The, f- the first time I saw it, it was when Fox was rebroadcasting it at, like, prime time. Had no idea it was edited. To get rid of, you know, yeah. the, the cable smut. All the stuff on HBO. But <laughs> it was still good. But anyway, you know, that's Death's Tales from the Crypt. Everybody needs to go listen to Tales from the... Sorry. Everybody needs to go watch Tales from the Crypt. And listen to and the Good listen Evening. And listen to her podcast. Yeah, and listen evening, to Good Evening Yeah, because like I said, I've, yes. been li- I've been watching the episodes before I listen to the podcast. And uh, it's really, it's, you know... Because, like, director, co- like, commentary tracks and stuff are really popular now. But, like, I feel like... I feel like this podcast is actually a really good um, accompaniment to oh, each you. episode, like a like an episode guide. So, I mean, as time goes on, you know, eventually she's going to get through the whole series, and it's going to be the very first time anyone has done that. So that's awesome. Uh, you know, has has done like an actual commentary to each individual episode. So this is definitely something that you want to keep your eye on because it's uh, it's important not only as a podcast but also as kind of an archival. Uh, you know, like an actual um, kind of a preservation, I guess, so to speak. Well, I'm going to yeah. save our plugs for later. Melissa, you want to hang out for a while, talk about Poison the Well? <laughs> sure. Also, uh, one more thing. I think there is one other podcast that did do it. Um, oh, really? They're do- they finished a few years ago. My because bad. I, no, it's fine. I took a look just in case. Okay. But the, I listened to some of their episodes, and it's definitely not as chronological, and it's more... A little all over the place. Like, yeah, there's a bunch of people, and they kind of talk all over. I mean, it's fine, but it's just like more audio so, clips. More like more like us. <laughs> we're, just <all laughs> over, we're, we're just all over the damn place. But yeah, yeah, mine's definitely more like chronological and gets into, I don't know, just I don't know, a little more involved in it, but yeah. Cool. So... Yeah, I guess I'll hang out a little bit. You yeah, know, I don't know what I can. Cool. Good evening, Kitty's podcast. Yeah, it's definitely worth your time. Check it out. Check it out. Um, and where can they find that podcast, Melissa? Uh, they can find it on Podbean uh, and iTunes. Okay, cool. Do you have a website, or is it uh, just straight on? I do have a just on Podbean. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. So Jeff, tell me yes, all about sir. Poison the Well. 
Oh, you're going to put me on the spot. This is it, Dan's in the top 10 favorite bands, and you're going to make me give a, a I like history. to shake things up every now Dan, and then. Dan's under a lot of stress right now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't have the intimate knowledge that, that Dan does. I think it's been pretty well established on where most of my music comes from, and it's a little weirder than... Switzerland? <laughs> yes, dude. You better believe it, man. Uh, yeah, the Swiss. Yeah. I actually, I Cy actually, Clarfield, man. I, I actually have listened to some Swiss, uh, to some Swiss metal. Um, don't make me name anybody because I can't pronounce any of their names. Um, <laughs> That's okay. But uh, just but, say Avatar. Just say yeah, Avatar. Yeah, I have over checked out some Swiss metal. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just sidestep this, um, so that Jeff doesn't have to feel uncomfortable. Um, po- Poison the Well is uh, one of one of the early incarnations of what we would call metalcore now. Hey, Dan. Yo, what's up, bro? Thanks for the save, bud. Hey, no, no problem. <laughs> I got you. I got you, buddy. Uh, so, Poison the Well, uh, you know, hard, like, back, I, I guess back when I first started listening to him, I would have called him a hardcore band. Um, but I, I would think that, I think that really a lot of what we hear in metalcore now, um, you can hear a little bit of in Poison the Well. Um, this was like a this was like a 1998, you know, what was like kind of kind of their formative time, like 97, 98 was like their formative years, and um, so th- th- these guys were playing metalcore, you know, when really metalcore wasn't really a thing because like typically when we say metalcore, what are we thinking? We're thinking like um, Kill Switch Engage, uh, In Flames, in, no In Flames, uh, this is melodic death metal. I, I I know, but that's what we're thinking. Correction. Jeff in flames was melodic death metal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now it's pop. Now it's like <laughs> we're thinking he is legend. We did that already, dude. I'm not I don't have the time <laughs> yeah, or the no. mood to go into that. <laughs> no, uh, no. I right. want to talk about a band I like. Um so for a band to sound like this in the, in the late 90s, it's a little unique in my opinion. I know there was a lot going on in the underground, but as far as bands that actually put records out, Poison the Well was kind of the cream of the crop as far as they were playing this combination of like hardcore and metal with a little bit of like emo in there a little bit. Just a little I think bit. There's some punk influences. There's too, some punk there one. too, sure. So was this around the same time as Hope's Fall? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, very mm-hmm. much. Because uh, it definitely shows on the first record, which we will get into shortly. Right. Well, this was this is like what I would call like pure American metalcore in the sense that. It doesn't have any of that Swedish Gothenburg influence to it. Like, not really. So they don't have the influence of awesomeness? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's just like your opinion, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> this, but, uh, this is Norma opinion. Jean, Hope's this Fall. This is before Norma Jean. It does precede Norma Jean. It but does it's, precede it's, the, mighty, the mighty Norma Jean, yes. But it, it is that time frame where, I mean... The saturation of new metal and the beginning of the early 2000s pop and more popular bands such as Linkin Park, that the hybrid music that happened in the early 2000s, this definitely s- starts off like one of those bands that was just trying to do the heaviest thing possible. And to quote uh, Dan at a particular band practice, let's just do the heaviest thing possible and then stop. Because this band does it a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of start to stop. Um, so, when Poison the Well started, they actually had two singers. Because if you if you listen to and if you go on like Spotify or Apple Music or whatever you kids use these days, um, you can actually hear a, uh, a demo album called uh, "Distance Makes the Gr- Heart Grow Fonder." And I actually found this to be more extreme. See, I didn't. I didn't have that stuff. You know, obviously back in like 99 or whatever, that was something that was released later um, on a different yeah, label. Unless you were down in Florida, I think that was probably the only way you could get it. Right, right? you could probably get wasn't it, it, it. Wasn't it like a 7 inch release or yeah, something like, like that? Yeah, it was a 10 inch. Yeah. Oh, it was a 10? Okay. Yeah. And um, it's a shame, too, that I discovered it so many years later because the material on it's really fucking good. I guess, I guess what you're getting with, with Poison the Well is. Um, you're getting you're getting passionate, screamed hardcore, um, and I even hate to use the word metalcore because I don't want anybody to think that we're talking about something that sounds modern. Because I don't think that Poison the Well necessarily sounds modern. This is hardcore that doesn't records. have thrash influence. 
this is hardcore that basically is just let's play heavy, but they're they're super super melodic for what they are, but not melodic like something like Hope's Fall where you know we're just going out into the atmosphere. This was just um, the I think the melody was just there more to accent the lyrics um, than anything else. And Distance Make the Heart Grow Fonder um, was essentially the start for the band. I think that record came out in '98. Um, Roughly, yeah, and it's 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 even a stretch calling it a record because it's really more of just a demo. And um, they actually had two singers. And the thing that I find the most notable about it is that it really has all the ingredients for what we're going to hear from Poison the Well <sighs> throughout their le- at the very least their next three albums. And you have s- heartfelt screamed vocals with passionate lyrics. You have um, a lot of melodic guitar work with breakdowns uh, thrown in there just to keep everybody interested. And um, there's also, vocally, there is a lot of spoken word sections. That's the point in the song where my wife says, why is he talking? Why is he just screaming? (laughs) And they do a lot of that. And literally all of those ingredients are present on Distance Makes the Heart Grow Fonder. And it's actually a different, it's a different lead vocalist than uh, would be on their debut, The Opposite of December. Before we get into The Opposite of December, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone that is listening to this podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Google Play. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. We are on TuneIn Radio. So if you have an Amazon Echo product, you can say to it, Alexa, play the latest episode of Discography Discussion, and she will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And Jeff is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. We love five-star reviews. But truthfully... We just like reviews. The more you review us, uh, the more notoriety we get. Even if it means you think we suck, we're okay with that. If you you think we suck, tell us why we suck so we can try to get better. Yeah. And we'll definitely read it on the show. Yeah, we will. And we don't mind, you know, people telling us we suck. I mean, we were all nerds in school, so we've had plenty of people tell us that we're terrible. So, yeah, how else can you? We'll take it. Constructive constriticism preferred constructive constriticism <laughs> yeah i know i know maybe i had a few too many between this elysian space dust and high brew coffee i'm having a good day oh i've been having uh shaffley coffee stout because oh, dan I got is it. jealous oh, he mixed it got the alcohol and the coffee woohoo yep they were 80 cents a bottle so Ooh. i couldn't pass that up it's pretty awesome yeah it is the opposite of december 1999 all hail the triggered bass drum. Melissa, am I right? Hell yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, maybe... <clears throat> okay. Way to just... Yeah, throw that out there. I, I, It's the first thing I heard, honestly. Yes, the bass drums are triggered. It was a thing that happened at some point and still kind of happens sometimes in metal. If it sounds good, then it's not a big deal, but I have heard some right, like albums where it's like you, it's just click, 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 like real... That's all you hear. It's pretty obvious. But on like this stands record, out but stands out compared to like the guitar and everything. It just But I'm not here to talk about that because I'm not a piece of shit musician. <laughs> uh, so He's a piece of shit vocalist. I'm a piece of shit singer. <laughs> and so as long as the vocals sound good, I'm I'm good. Would you say that Poison the Well was like an influence on how you scream? Uh huge, yeah. Yeah. Poison the Well, Hope's Fall, Zayo. Zayo again because, you know, it it deserves two entries. Okay then, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely a huge influence on me as a screamer. Um, uh, I really, what I liked about Poison the Well is that I, actually a lot of the bands that were out at that time were more of a rasp scream. That was the big thing in metalcore for a while was the vocal that sounded like this versus was just a, a, guy, a guy screaming and and I love that and when I when I first started screaming that's what I wanted to do was I wanted to have that raspy yeah. serpentine uh, type of vocal um, but Poison the Well kind of really brought me into the fold as far as like 
this was like really guttural, passionate screaming with lyrics that I agreed with, and I think they were just it, for what I for what I, I guess this is, it all really just boils down to personal preference, but there was just something about the way um, Poison Well screamed that um, that just resonated with me. Um, more so, uh, more so than the raspy vocal. I thought maybe it was a little bit better at conveying emotion. Yeah, he's believable. Yeah, I mean, at least, yeah, at least for me. Um, no, I, I completely agree. I their early stuff, I think, is fantastic. It really is. Um, and this this record, the one, opposite of December, it's a it's a quick it's a quick burn. It's a quick cigarette, but on a lunch break, you know, it's uh, thirty minutes in and out. But you're going to feel better whenever you're done listening to it. Lyrics are extremely sappy. Um, a little more emo. Hey, it's, if you had if you read the lyrics without hearing the band, you'd be pretty surprised, I think, when you heard the band. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The, the, sorry, the, the, the vocals sound pretty pained in some of it. So, I mean, are the lyrics a little more uh, emotional in the sense of pain? Yeah, yeah, that is. It's, and, it's, of course, it's like, you know, I'm 15 and my girlfriend, you know. <laughs> My girlfriend decided she wanted to be fr- girlfriend of someone else. Hey, or, at fifteen, that's pain. It is, and and but and you can really hear that. Yeah, yeah. I, rem- I remember punching my locker over girls in fifteen. Yeah. How does that Weezer <laughs> song go? My girlfriend wants to be another girlfriend's girlfriend. I forget. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, my it's, version. Uh, it's one of those things where this band really, really hits how I was feeling at the time this came out. You know, um, this was, you know, this is 1999. Um, those, I, I'm sorry, I'm such a fanboy about this that it's it's really hard. It's for okay, me to, you can let it out. To it, articulate, just don't but, go full fanboy, right? Um, this was, I mean, this like anybody anybody that's ever heard me sing or play or whatever, and um, thought that I was cool original. I'm not, man. Like you, you can find all of it on this record. Well, I mean, literally all of it. The 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 the, the spoken word vocals, um, the screams, everything. Um, there's just something just really awesome about screaming over melodic, heavy riffs, and and this record has that in spades. Um, the only thing it, it, I think it's a little harder for me to get to get into as an adult, because a lot of the lyrics deal with just like relational problems. And they were problems that I was definitely having and could relate to back then. Um, <laughs> Wasn't that the symptom of early hardcore, though? It was yeah. all about relationships. Yeah, dude. So I got to ask you, Dan. Yeah, what's up, bro? Does that, does that mean you like to emulate Jeff? What do you mean? Well, Jeff, that's the lead singer. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm just having a little fun since I'm a Jeff. And yeah. He's a Jeff. And no, I know what you're trying to do. I'm just making it's it It's safe to say that Dan is heavily influenced by Jeff and yes. Dan. <laughs> yeah. 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 My two favorite singers are Jeff and Dan. That's funny. I never even thought about that before. <laughs> but does it change you as a person? No, it doesn't. It should. Um, I'm just a carbon copy of what I, what I consume. So, uh, so now I know how I got the gig. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's it's a very punk mentality to be upfront with your lyrics. There's nothing pop sensible about it. So where punk was play fast and be dysfunctional and be in your face and offensive, this is be loud, be heavy be in your face and not really be offensive, at least as far as Poison the Well goes. I know other hardcore bands subscribe to that, but they're very much, this is how I'm feeling. Here's what I like about stuff like Poison the Well and Hope's Fall and stuff in in that same vein is that this was heavy music that wasn't being made by tough guys. This isn't like this isn't like Pantera, you know. You better walk on, homeboy. Oh, no way, punk. You know, this isn't Limp Bizkit. Like, yeah, it's not like I'm gonna rolling. break your fucking face tonight. You know, it's not. <laughs> it's not like that. This is this is a real person that you can identify with. But because you like heavy tunes, you get that too. You know, um, and that's you know, bands like this are the, are the reason why I'm just not a big fan of like tough guy 
music and um you didn't ever want to break someone's face right no i have definitely wanted to break someone's <laughs> face before but but he was um, feeling it all on the inside but i'm when feeling he did it, it yeah but i can yeah, but, but i can but he didn't want to break somebody's why. face because phil told him he needed to break somebody's exactly face. <laughs> yeah yeah i i really like these guys because you know i it prior to poison the well coming out maybe not i had a a real strong emo background i mean go ahead and tell me about your favorites from the 90s jeff yeah, I know. Well, I, I won't, other than Sunny Day Real Estate. I was waiting knows for that. it. <laughs> I got to put that on every damn episode. But yeah, it, this was like, you know, Diary turned up to 11 for me. So I I love these guys early on. I thought they were fantastic. And this, I mean, this is an easy, this is an easy episode to do because I know Dan and I both dig these guys. So their, their early stuff is just something that everybody needs to check out. Yeah, I really like the song Nerdy a lot. It's one of the standout songs for me. And again, there's nothing tough about it. It's like, why do your eyes paralyze me? Like, it's such a, like a, oh man, I love her, but she doesn't even know I exist. You know, and it's like, it's <laughs> like, if this came out in 2000, if this, came, if this record had come out six years later, it would be considered generic and trite. But in the context of when it was released, it, it was sounded completely legitimate. And completely, um, completely understandable. I definitely love me some "My New Mirror No Longer Reflects." Dude, that song when he when he stops screaming and just stops, he's like, "Smash me to the ground one thousand times as before," but I can't rationalize anymore. Oh my god, that song kicks my ass. It's the definition of a super fan who steps in with lyrics when you're talking about a song. And I almost had a Jeff moment where I was going to tell you about the atmosphere and the feel of the song. <laughs> but Dan yeah. has overwhelmed me with you his can do lyrical that amazingness. You can do that now. Oh no, it, it, it's it's all about the lyrics now. Cause well, yeah, dude, I want to wish for wings that work. There's a pause, you know, where he said it's track two. Uh, <laughs> there's a pause where he just goes in and That's like, Dan code for play track two playing, now. Oh yeah. my god, he's just, he's like, he's like i could never swallow your false ideals of a lifeless happy ending and it's just oh my god that just that that was one of the very first things about the band that caught me and i don't i don't really have a lot of bad things to say about this record it's um it's so short it's kind of hard to fuck up right i i kind of have the same mentality <laughs> about it as i do the satellite years i don't know if it's perfect but it as what it is is perfect yeah, it's damn close to perfect if it's not. Um, the only, Really, the only thing I can say about it that I could criticize is maybe the the melodic singing just wasn't there. Yeah, um, not yet. He That guy could sing about as well as I can now. Um, it's a very... That's a slide rule if I've ever heard one. It's narrow. It, well, it's... <laughs> it's nasally. It sounds a little emo. But back in 1999, nobody was getting criticized for that, and it was probably the best you could do. And it was really, but in, and again, it was passionate. What's wrong with nasally and emo? Nothing. See, All I was right, kind good. of thinking that too. In a way, if their lyrics were the way they are, like, I mean, just makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Dan is definitely the uh, the lyric god. He analyzes and over over analyzes all the lyrics, and I'm just on the complete other end of the spectrum i'm looking for the emotion on of whatever it is do i get to say it <laughs> yes go for it you are now entering jeffrey's atmosphere <laughs> you, i don't know I, I, I was jeffrey i think i'm in trouble <laughs> oh I, I i i was expecting the, the atmosphere to start in the next record so are we oh, moving it, on it, to it tear so, from so, the red absolutely yeah, but now this is my favorite album, and it's not even really? cl close. Really? It's not even close. I I listened to this album like six times today. Oh my I'm god, dude. This record is... I mean, in a purely unbiased way, it's the same record as the other one. But much more focus on melody here than what we'd had before the singing's better it's one of those things where it's like they did the same thing again only better if that yes. makes sense they wrote better songs they did I, oh my god dude botula i, I definitely get Ugh. the feeling from listening to tear from the red 
I get the same feeling I got the first time I heard Magnetic North after listening to the Satellite Years. It's just that again. Only we turned it up to 17. We're not even stopping at 11. It's just the same thing, only better. Yeah, I mean, uh, this record, again, it, like lyrically, it's pretty much the exact same record as the previous. But musically, there is much more focus on melody over aggression, or not necessarily aggression, but more melody over just heavy riffs. And um, it does create a, here we go, trademark atmosphere. <laughs> You're um, now entering Daniel's atmosphere. That the other, that the other record, well, that the opposite of December didn't really have. I mean, it, that, you know, again, I don't have anything bad to say about that record, but um, I can't fault it for not being this record. But you were saying that both records are fairly similar, but I mean, has this one got a little more length to it? Like, is this no, similar? they're the same, 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 same length. length. Yeah, like I couldn't be more honest about them essentially being the yeah. same record um, because they were actually recently re-released as the same record. That's what I've got. <laughs> yeah, hmm. like there, there's a double. There, there, there's an actual LP. You can fit both records on one LP. <laughs> Sounds like System of a Down. Yeah. Oh, did I just say that? Yeah. Um. So, uh, I, I know Jeff's got a lot to say, so I want to shut the fuck up as soon as I can. But um, that's a no, lie. That's okay. You know it. <laughs> but I mean, like the singing's better. The at, the melodies are more apparent. But it doesn't. It doesn't sound commercial. That, like it still sounds like a legitimate. We wanted to get better, not somebody was pushing us to be more commercial because these songs are much more are are, are very much in the same vein of being heartfelt and real. Um, like songs like Botula, um, you know, we just start to just, just like, but I adore her. This will never happen, you know, like, and how just bust into him, just basically, I mean, he's screaming. It almost sounds like he's crying, you know, he's, he's like, but I adore her, you know, I mean, it was just, Botula is just one of the, um, one of my favorite songs to play in the basement alone, you know, um, and, uh, that's where I've been all day. Maybe that's why I've been listening to this album <laughs> nonstop. I did notice that this record was a little bit more aggressive lyrically than, uh, on, the opposite of December was very much again like why do your eyes paralyze me and all this stuff. Um, this is the this is the part of puberty I think that they hit, you know, in that um, they're a little bit more aggressive about these topics. So instead of being like you know to to mandate heaven, a wish for wings that work, you it, know, it definitely it's feels more, less tolerant. It is. It's more, um, you know, he starts off. Uh, he starts off, uh, Lazaro, uh, you said you missed me, but what about the demons in my head? I'm sure you don't miss them. You know, like, um, that's, wow. uh, yeah, so like that, you know, it's a little bit scarier, I guess, uh, than it was before. Um, they even have a song called Horns and Tails on there, which is like, uh, what would I do for just one more day without you? And there's a really funny part in that song, too, where he... He's like, all I wanted to say was, and then they like, way in the background, it sounds like ten miles away. You hear him just scream, "Fuck you!" Yeah! <laughs> and uh, oh man, that was so cool. Um, I loved that song, dude. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna sit here and listen to "Rings from Corona." Oh, that's a good one. And I'm gonna let Jeff just let it out, dude. The breakdown on that so song is just Jeff, devastating. So Jeff, three, two, one. Take it, man. Well, it's pretty simple. I have the same recipe, you know, for everything that I'm looking for. I, the quote unquote Jeff's atmosphere. Yes. That, you know, and I have to be able to listen to it from cover to cover. And uh, this album completely encompasses it. And the fact that it's only a half hour makes it easier to go back and re listen to it back to back. So. You know, because you know, we we go from what well, swallow the sun, where we have like three hour albums, and now we have thirty minute <laughs> albums. Yeah, dude, that's the that's... good music is okay. Yeah, but good music is good music. I mean, if you if you like it, you like it, and that's what I always tell everybody. I'm like, you know, listen for yourself. Don't listen for anybody else. And uh, if you enjoy it, you know, 
just crank it up and listen to it as much as you want and uh, that's why i like this album like you said it's there's a little more substance to it it's like they polished uh polished up from the from their uh their freshman effort and they didn't have a sophomore slump i mean this is a this is a great album i i I listened to it a, a lot this week, and especially today. I'm, I'm not kidding when I said I listened to it like six times today, because yeah. I've been cleaning out my basement. So, it, it's 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 enough of a kick in the pants to get you going, but there's an, there's enough melody and clean singing. You know, I I'm a pretty emotional guy, so I I like the roller coasters that they take you on. I think that's that's really really important in, in music, and I think that's why I like the uh, contrasting styles between you know the hardcore and the melodic and the clean vocals, and the screaming, and that's why there's so much appeal to bands like this to me. Uh, it, it, it's it's the whole package, and I like I actually like the fact that you know they kind of you know they still have a bit of their uh, punk sensibilities you know, and a lot of these songs are are pretty short they, they're not looking you know for this epic you know 15 minute dream theater-esque you know look how look at me and and see how good i can play they're just like you know this is what we feel and this is what we're giving you yeah it's it's music that's not up its own ass you know <laughs> not <laughs> yet <laughs> well the shorter ep- um albums can be kind of nice too because if it's if you got a half hour you can kind of have an experience mm-hmm. you know you listen from track one to the end and right. just everything flows i kind of think uh, song order is important in a lot of, oh, a lot yeah. of ways. Um, if they can make one that where it just flows real well. Yeah, and and that's that's something I was going to bring up too is that this record um, flows better than the opposite of December. Um, and I'm always like, I hold that first record in such high regard that anytime I'm saying something positive about the next record, I feel like I'm <laughs> saying that that wasn't there on the or the the first record wasn't as good. Um, but the the first because record, it wasn't the first record was a collection of hardcore songs. <laughs> you know what I mean. And the second record was a collection of hardcore songs with an actual map. You know, and uh, yeah, the placement of songs in Tear from the Red was just phenomenal. They did a really great job. Uh, I have always been the track listing guy. Not that I change records, but whenever I'm creating music, I've always said. The order is important, and our good buddy Brandon Kellum has pointed out many times as far as the way they make records, rather than give you 60 minutes and half of it is good, let's just give you the half that's good, get in, get out, and that's it. Right. And this is definitely, we're not going to hang out for two hours and play a bunch of songs that are mediocre. We're going to give you our best 30 minutes, and we're going to get off the stage. Right. Right. And that started, I mean, it's, it's a punk mentality that started many years ago, but it kind of resurged. It kind of resurfaced in the late 90s and found its way into the mid to late 2000s. And even today, the bands have really latched onto that, and it's not about the crap. It's not about, look at me and how good I can play. It's, look at how awesome we are. Yeah, I mean, as much as I love technical music, I also like a music that I feel like is honest. And um, Boys in the Well has that in spades. Um, even on their later releases that don't necessarily sound like this. So I think um, it's time for you come before you. Yeah, I was going to say, before we start that record, uh, can I get a take a beer break real quick? I mean, if you absolutely insist, you go right ahead. All right, sounds good, man. So, Dan, Dan you're going to be kind of sort of proud of me. Okay. I... I I got on the bike. I might. It, it, it still might have training wheels on it. Okay. But I'm having a dry hopped APA. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> before we get going here, uh, you guys want to hear a fun bathroom story? Hell yeah. Let's Hell do yeah. It. Yeah. So uh, Joe has a bidet. This is going on the show, by the way. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Uh, Joe has a bidet, and I've never used one of those. Um, thought I'd try it out for like a second. Uh, I've never had an enema before, but I feel like it's something like that. And oh, damn. I, after, I think it scared me because I got up and was going to leave, and I realized I didn't pee. You come before you. All right, so side story. Good album. Side, side story here. Uh, I have been at work. Well, I worked from 10.30 a.m. 
on Friday night until 1.30 p.m. Saturday afternoon. I had to drive to several different places, and the entire time I was driving, I was listening to You Come Before You by Poison the Will. Is it a terrible thing for me to say this sounds like an Atlantic Records hardcore band? I don't think so. Because that's who released this record. I don't think this is any different, honestly. No, it's not. Maybe just a little more polished. But I, back to Dan's side story. This is what I got in the middle of the... Well, it was about 10 o'clock. 9.30 to be exact. Uh, I'm having the worst day of my fucking life today. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. who? Somebody died. <laughs> I'm like... It, 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 his wife left him. I'm like, oh, shit. And he's like, no, I've just been working for 20 some odd hours. I'm like, oh, shit. Well, that sucks, but you are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I was so freaking out. I was like, oh, was my God. Okay. He's like, I thought I was going to have to, like, like go, like, c- you know, pick him up and console him and, and you know, do the, the friend thing. I was freaking out. And I was like, nope, he's just delirious because he's been working for too damn long. Yep. <laughs> it was one of those 36 hour days. Okay, so let's start with Ghost Chant. Holy shit. Does this song just jump in out of the gate? Um, I feel the same way I felt the first time I heard Bring Out the Rum, Bring Out the this Rum. Is, this is the <laughs> same band, but with a budget. <laughs> <laughs> this shit sounds insane it captures the heaviness of the band in a way that has never been captured on audio before yeah and as you know what's really weird is you know I've, i'm always the one that likes the almost to the point of being overproduced for this type of band i actually like the the rawness of the previous two albums as yeah. compared to the, the polish that's on this it, you know, and i i'm probably in the minority when it comes to that but for whatever reason, I mean, it's still good. It's still great. It's the last good album that they did. But I just couldn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't like it as much as the other two because to me, they're. It was almost like they had too big of a budget. But like I like their uh, the cheap punk counterculture feel to the first two. I really, really dig that, I, and I think that suits them well. But I'm, you're going to tell me why I'm wrong, right, Dan? You're Absolutely. completely wrong because this is my favorite Poison the Well record. Um, and I love the other two like 150%. It's just that this record is so much heavier. Um, like, Melissa, you asked me earlier if the screams for Poison the Well influenced me as a screamer. Yeah. But what, what I the shit that I do is much closer to what is on here oh, okay. than what was on the first two records. Um it's more of a hard guy, more of a deeper hardcore scream. Whereas the other records were a little bit more emotional. This is just guttural, guttural, guttural. A throaty. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, it's intense. But on the flip side, the actual melodic singing, five hundred percent better. So who took on this vocal record? lessons? That's I, my question. I, I do agree oh, with absolutely. that. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Definitely there was a vocal coach involved. I am certain of that. Yeah, the melodic singing is actually really, really good. The clean singing is is stellar. Yeah. yeah if, there was, if there was one thing I do like more about this album as compared to the past two, it is that. Yeah. Um, I feel like the sing scream dynamic is, is, up, is upheld more here than they did on the regular I mean they sang on the other records too but like it wasn't like a verse chorus for verse thing like it is here and again this record is absolutely um the product of corporate meddling um I think the band wrote the record and then a producer came in and was like well you need to sing and scream here you need to you know um and they really did you know they really did that every every ever since everybody heard Slipknot's Wait and Bleed back in the day you know, they decided that everybody, every every heavy band had to have this dynamic of a sing, scream, sing, scream. Um, and it, it'd be it'd be quantized and packaged up and, you know, its own its own deal. 
Uh, and that's that's very evident on this record. This is a very poppy Poison the Well record. And I would love to say that I hate it for that, but I don't. I get the feeling somebody listened to Hope's Fall and said, we need to make it sound like that. And then that was what everybody said for about five years. Yeah, possible. And it started here. I don't here. think so. But it, 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 it didn't get so budgetized quite yet, but this is kind of where it starts. This might have been the peak of their sound. I, yeah, it was, and I think that I think this record. Um, first of all, let me let me just take a couple of uh, moments to point out some of my favorite lyrics on this record. Do they um, include "Mini Again" for the first time? Uh, yes. Well, yeah, I think he, I think at the beginning of that song he says "barely able to keep the lids open," which I can very much relate to. Especially right now, <laughs> right? Um, you got two more after this, so we'll get through it. Oh, dude! Uh, the the first song he's like, "How many times do I have to throw the switch to warn you about jumping in the back of the cars?" Um, <laughs> the second song, um, uh, he's like, "Stare, stare across from you. Why are we even here? There is no way to make up for these twenty years." Like these these songs are still very emotional. But they're a little bit more mature than what we'd had on the previous records where record one was my girlfriend is so great, but she's not really my girlfriend. I really want her to be. The second record was, um, you know, I hate that bitch. Um, <laughs> and then the third re- and then the third record is like these are actual like real world people problems I'm having. Um, you know, there's a song about about reuniting with a with a loved one. Um, or trying to reconcile with a loved one, and uh, yeah, there aren't a whole lot of like love songs. Like a lot of the lyrics talk about depression. Um, on one song at the end, he just screams, "I just want to be fucking happy." Um, you know, uh, many again for the first time, his happiness is not having to. Then he's like lying on the floor, dead, all alone. You know, like I don't know, man. Like this record is just full of. Um, Maybe shit that like I'm going through more as an adult now, um, but there is nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing, gentlemen, that can top the beauty of the closing track, "Crystal Lake." Now, which it's, it's, is it's October, which is my. I mean, yesterday was Friday uh, the thirteenth, <laughs> which is of all time my favorite Poison the Well song, and why is that? Oh my god. The lyrics are fucking on point. Ugh. Overheard your conversation tonight and I'm not satisfied. Sitting here, I realize I always think I'm right. So now it's over for all of you. <laughs> and as it goes, um, you definitely get the uh, impression that he is killing people and throwing them into a lake. In the final breakdown, he's like, stare at me now on your way down. Stare at me now on your way down. Um, This is my pissed off song. This is my go-to song anytime I need to wake up. So needless to say, I have been listening to this song a lot in the past 28 hours. Okay? This song is amazing. The guitar worker is amazing. Is amazing. The, The pace of the song is amazing. There is literally no clean singing on this song at all. Which is fantastic. Now we really know why Dan likes it. No, I love the clean singing <laughs> of Poison the Well. This song doesn't have it. Um, this this is Ghost Chant is one of the best album openers I've ever heard, and Crystal Lake is one of the best album closers I've ever heard. People may have varying opinions on what's between those two pieces of bread, but you know. Um, I think it's. I think it makes a mighty good sandwich. I don't know how you're going to top that on versions. You're not. We've got two you're records not. to go. <laughs> so well, they, these last two, I think, are going to go a little quicker than the first few. Oh, they definitely are. So are we going to? We going to hop right in? Yeah, we can go to versions if you want. 2007 versions. Jeff, I'm afraid. No. Well, yeah. Well. There's a, a dynamic shift here, and it's because one of the primary uh, writers in the band Go is on. no longer with the band. 
Right. And that, unfortunately, I think if I remember correctly, while they were in the process of making this album, he left right in the middle of it. I just like, I don't know why he quit, but I know he quit. I don't know if it was, you know, creative differences, because I know everything that he did, they scrapped and then they started from scratch. And they didn't. Uh, one of the things that I, that I've read while perusing the internet, but you got to take with a grain of salt, was they didn't like the direction that he was leading them. And I'm like, well, if the direction was where the last two in the last two albums were, I think it was a pretty damn good direction. And right. uh, they took a right turn uh, when they should have kept on going straight. If you ask me. Now the fact that he they got rid of all his stuff does that mean you know, there was maybe something like legal over like the copyright of his work or? I'm pretty sure it was just a dick move. Yeah. Yeah. Like screw that guy. Yeah, it was a. F- I think it was more of a fuck you than. Yeah, a, like we don't yeah. even want it at all. Yeah, you, you. Yeah. Yeah, you left right in the middle of the process. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. I think that's kind of how they looked at it. I mean, I'd be pissed off if somebody did that to me. But, but you're right. You know, there could be some sort of legality yeah. behind it too, where he owns those rights and he does it. Maybe he's the one that pulled the dick move and said, "Hey, yeah. I don't want you guys touching my stuff. I'm not in the band anymore. That's my music. My name is on it. You can't use it legally, or something like that." And you said he was the, he was the lyricist or just the writer of the. Well, he was well, he was the a... uh, rhythm guitarist, right, Dan? Yes, but the, here's the thing. Sounds like Dave Mustaine about no, it. No, 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 no. Because we have no idea what happened with that break. That's it true. It could have been a completely amicable break. It's not a, a huge thing. I think no matter what, this record would have sounded like it sounds anyway, or it would have been still a huge dynamic shift because I do know that the band did have issues with Atlantic Records because this was not released by Atlantic Records. And this was also released, I believe, like a good four years after You Come Before You. That is correct. So this was more of like a return for the band. You know, um, because yeah, you come before you was what oh three, and this was like oh seven or oh nine. Two thousand seven okay. was versions. Seven. The Tropic yeah. Riot came out in two thousand two thousand nine. Yeah, both by Ferret Records. Yeah, so obviously, you know, they've kind of gone back to where they were before in the sense of being on smaller labels. Um, versions is a weird record because. There was no transitional record between You Come Before You and this. Um, and in a lot of ways, I could almost under I could almost see listening to the Tropic Rot like in between You Come Before You and this record. I feel like this one really just goes out into space after a while. Um, it's very melodic. It's not really a hardcore record. Well, you're taking us out into space now, it's are you? It's passionate. It's passionate, but it's it's different. Um, it's not the same type of passion, and I think that's that's what bothers me about it is this is a little bit more artsy fartsy, and a little bit less, um, you know, raw guttural emotion. And unfortunately, that's that's the reason I listen to Poison the Well is for that raw guttural emotion. It's and, the two thousands version of punk rock. It's well, all about emotion. I mean, and it's in there. Like, in no way am I saying that Versions is a bad record. But it's not my go-to when I'm thinking of, like, I want to listen to Poison the Well. I'm going to listen to one of those three first records. Yeah, hands down. I'd say this is, at best, in my opinion, this is an average uh, entry. It's definitely my least favorite of their five. I'm with you on that. It is definitely my least favorite. I agree. It in, you know, I don't. I've said it multiple times. I don't mind people taking, you know, a complete, you know, 90 degree turn and going off in a different direction of what we thought they were going to do as long as they do it well, as long as they can pull it off. And that's just not the case here. I mean, we've mentioned it, you know, uh, we've beaten that dead horse called contortionist to death. You know, they totally changed styles and it's fan fucking tastic. Mm hmm. But this is not. This is just, eh. It's not bad, but I also don't think it's good. It sounds like you come before you was a glass of water, and versions is like that glass of water poured out all over the kitchen floor. 
So you're saying the, the that element, versions is look at this puddle of water I made. The elements are the elements are all there that were on you come before you, but it's just it's done in a much more spread out way. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, There's not enough meat there, right? It's not enjoy. It's not enjoyable because when that water was in the glass, it was in a more compressed, consumable form. And it's not as much on this record. And I still do like versions, um, but I don't love it. Do That's, you have any standout tracks on it, Dan? Not really, man. I yeah, I, I don't either. That's I I tried, and then I just couldn't do it on this one. Yeah, I mean, I'll throw. I, a I couple, know that sounds bad, but I'll throw a couple onto the playlist. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I'm kind of meh. I'm a little indifferent on it. So so that was quick. Next so. record, <laughs> <laughs> the Tropic Rot. Yeah, the Tropic Rot. I thought this That's one was cool. a little bit more of a return to form. I I would agree. Uh, but it's just not you're not completely back you know after there was such a a right turn uh, I would actually I was actually kind of hoping that they would actually uh, stick to their guns and you know find a way to make it work instead of trying to go back you know to going back to the well <laughs> so to speak to you know I, I, I wish that I wish that wasn't the case you know Whenever you do try something different, you know, that's okay. You know, try to work through it, try to figure it out, and you have a new sound. Just don't go back to the old because the new one just didn't work that for the one album. Right. Well, it's okay. I don't necessarily think that the Tropic Rot sounds like Poison the Well. At least they don't sound like the Poison the Well that I'm into. Right. It I do like Exist Underground, though. It, yeah, it definitely does sound like poison the well it sounds like the same poison the well that put out versions but it's like a better version of the versions band yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a tweener i think it's merging the two and it almost sounds like i said earlier that it, the, like this record should have come before versions well that's why that's why i say that i, th- I think it's it's like you said it still has versions but it's it's got stuff from the fr- previous three albums on it as well right right I like that name, Tropic Rod. Is that one of the s- songs on the album, or is that something they came up with themselves? No, yeah, yeah, there's no, there's, I don't think yeah, there's, there's any songs there's on no the album. There's no title track. Either. Okay, that is yeah. a clever name. Yeah, and it's great. Um, there's an elephant on the CD. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, I listened to the Tropic Rod a lot when it came out. Um, Sparks it will rain, cinema. I like uh, Antarctica inside me is one of my favorite. <laughs> Um, that sounds painful. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds. It definitely sounds cold. Um, yeah, the cold but, inside uh, me. Yeah. yeah, no, it definitely sounds cold. But uh, no, I don't know, man. Uh, the Tropic Rot's a really good record. It's really solid. I just don't love it like I love the first three. And I don't think that Poison the Well has ever put out an album that I'm like, this is shit. Skip it. <laughs> you know. Um, it's just kind of a weird slump that I, I don't know. Uh, slumps. I don't know. Right Vers- version's awfully close to skip for me. Really? You'd think it's that bad? I, I really do. I just. I don't think there's anything bad about it at all. I just don't love it. it it's just meh. But that's that's how I feel about it. it. It's not bad. But, you know, it, it's a thing sometimes that exists. It, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when stuff is just so bad, you, you, you kind of like have the train wreck issue where you keep staring at it when something's so bad sure but yeah this it's just it's average and the traffic rot is uh, a little bit above average the problem is is that the first three were really above average (laughs) we're awesome yeah Yeah. well let me ask you this this was 2009 correct Yes. Yeah. So, what bands were out at this time that were doing this style only better? I mean, I think it's kind of hard to nail down this style. Hardcore. I still feel like this pure is, hardcore. I don't think this is pure hardcore. This is like a hard. This is a hardcore band trying to play experimental music. Red. I don't think it sounds like Red. <laughs> what are you talking about? This doesn't sound anything like Breaking Benjamin. Oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> I shed a tear from the red. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, it's good. 
It's not great. I think it's good too. I mean, and I don't I listen think to it seventeen times. I don't think it's all that different than Magnetic North. You know, stylistically, and that it's, uh, it's, and again, I love Magnetic North. I but, and I don't love these records as much, but uh, I feel like it's it's the same idea of like. I'm not going into this. I think I was initially disappointed because um, it didn't sound like the previous records did. And I understand, too, that for certain people that if they're prepping up for this or they haven't listened to the band a whole lot beforehand, you know, it's very jarring to hear it all at once versus hearing it happen over time like I did. You know, I mean, I waited for these records to come out, you know. So this was another one of those, at the time, it was exactly what I needed. No, at the time, I fucking hated it. <laughs> but over time, I've come to appreciate the records for what they are versus what my expectation of them was. So that's why I'm giving them so much credit. I'm going to kind of cheat and sneak my final thoughts in now because it's appropriate if Hope's Fall is the band that's sending us into orbit, Poison the Well is kind of the band that's hanging out on the space station just jamming. Yeah. Like, we're, we're, we're here, They'll buy you but the we're beers. indoors. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? I just think that these are, I think that these are good records, but they're not exactly like why I listen to Poison the Well. So why do you listen to Poison the Well? I listen to Poison the Well for um, intensity. Um passion and guttural heartfelt screaming do you get that more from the first three albums yes oh absolutely so in spades what is your favorite poison the well record then oh well, you we already said it's my favorite is actually you come before you what about you jeff i'm i'm pretty much with dan the first three albums are damn near masterpieces for the type of music that they're they were looking to create uh, I really, really like the the emotion. I mean, it it's like we t- we said earlier. I mean, it's got a bit of an an emo feel to it, and I I like that. I I want music to move me, and I feel moved on the first three. The last two, not so much. But that's, I mean, that's okay. You know, it, that's that's why there's this thing called a discography, and that's why we have this podcast. We always get to go back to what it is that we like if there's other you know albums that we don't particularly care for what's your final thoughts dan well i think that poison the well like and again because i'm a fanboy i'm gonna still i'm still gonna defend versions and the tropic rot and say that they're still um they're still really good records because like when a band that i love puts out a record that i don't love as much i still like it more than i liked any other release that year because i'm that kind of guy um, and there's nothing, there's nothing on versions or on the Tropic Rot that I would say, this is shit. Get rid of this, get rid of that. You know, it's a, de- it's a conscious decision that the band made to go in that direction. Um, and some days I have more respect for it than I do other days. That's my final thought. Melissa. Uh, well, I did notice uh, uh, here that um, they went on hiatus in 2010. Yes. But they came back for some reunion shows in 2015 and 2016. Did you guys ever check any of that out? Unfortunately, I could never attend any of the shows. Or even just like recorded video or anything? No. uh, YouTube probably would be my friend on that. Yeah. I know they did play a lot of the older songs for those, which, which, you know, might mean something. (laughs) I think that Poison the Well is a good baseline for hardcore, especially the early records are... Phenomenal, in my opinion. I think if Super Mario Brothers is the first game any anybody ever played, and you keep going back to it, not just because it's the first game, but because it's great, Poison the Well might be that hardcore band that you just go back to to remind yourself why you like hardcore. Word. <laughs> what's your album of the week, Jeff? Oh, Subway Gods by Too Many Zoos. There is a saxophone, a trumpet, Douche. and a drummer, <laughs> and no vocals for the for the most part. I mean, they have guest vocalists on there. I love that shit. It doesn't, you know. I know it's not metal, but my god, that stuff is great. And what's what's funny is they 
they now are on a um a Google commercial. So I guess they've hit the big time. But yeah, I, I love all those guys. I've been following them ever since they uh went viral on YouTube with their um their New York uh, subway stuff where they were um recorded playing live down in the subway. And I've loved them ever since. Well, since one of my favorite drum friends is in the room, I'm gonna say overcome by all that remains. Not because it's great. Because the drums are just fun. It's really not great. <laughs> Can I do an album of the week? You yeah. absolutely have absolutely. to. Absolutely. Right. What do you got? Uh, I'm going to say uh, The Kills Midnight Boom. It's a, it's a duo of like a guy who does a lot of the guitar and vocals, and then they kind of have some um, programmed drums and things like that. But uh, the singer is a female. She went on to be in Dead Weather, which is one of Jack White's uh, side projects. I love okay, me some cool. Dead Weather. So, yeah. yeah. It's pretty fun. Whatever happened to Meg, seriously? Uh, I think she's okay now, but I know she had some like mental problems when they were on tour. Totally a little all. Bit, some stress and things like that. <laughs> but I think she's okay now. Dan, what about you? I hope so. <laughs> well, uh, I've been listening to If the Flames Don't Kill Us, We Will by A Jealousy Issue. And here's the thing about that. <laughs> Do you remember how Poison the Well had a different singer on Distance Makes the Heart Grow Fonder? I do. Well, that's this other band is his band. And everybody needs to go check that out? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, I think Dan has had enough. Mel- <laughs> Melissa, you need to come back more often. Oh, okay. Now that you're an established you know, guest, sure. you know, the door is always open. All right. So we're going to be giving well, you a full rundown of the bands that we listen to. Yeah, let me know uh, Let me know some of the future bands. We'll come back if it's one that I strikes cool. my fancy. Yeah. Or, we, or you can pick one out yourself. Ooh. I don't know. I got to stick with the metal, right? So. Well, yeah, you're going to have to get it yeah. by me. <laughs> but, yeah. And there's so many genres of metal. So I guess I have a lot of options. We should talk about that sometime. Oh, yes. no, we All the not. genres of no. metal. A 19-hour podcast brought to you by Discuss Metal. Yeah. Every time I do, if with anyone, unfortunately, you find out a new genre that you had no idea existed. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I think you just made that one up. The asshole genre. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, this has been episode 34 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please, send questions and comments to DanAndJoeShow at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash DiscussMetal. We have some sweet perks. Give me your money! Good Evening Kitties can be found at goodeveningpod.podbean.com. That's right. We'll see you guys next week. Deuces. Deuces.